All right, thank you. Excited to be here. Appreciate you all for uh, attending this afternoon and uh, excited to talk to you about this. I think it's a pretty relevant topic after the, the talk that we just saw. Um, been a really exciting couple of days here. It's a great conference. Uh, I want to say a special thanks to Medicinal Genomics and their team for putting this together. Um, I've spent a lot of, a lot of time here uh, with different folks and really enjoyed a lot of the presentations. So uh, really honored to be here and, and see the advancements in science uh, around cannabis that we're making uh, collectively. Just a quick background on myself. I'm a PhD organic chemist, spent about uh, 15 years in molecular diagnostics, uh, human diagnostics, working on uh, early detection of cancer, heart disease, and uh, building assay te technologies and platforms to support uh, clinical trial submissions for drug discovery. Spent a couple of years in food safety as well, working on pathogen detection platforms, things like salmonella, listeria, and E. coli. I made the move into agriculture about three and a half years ago to start Front Range Biosciences, and I've been very fortunate in that time to assemble a world-class team of folks that have probably collectively over 100 years of experience in uh, commercial agriculture, agronomy, tissue culture, um, some of the things we'll talk about today, plant breeding. And so a lot of what I'm gonna talk about here represents really their, their collective knowledge and, uh, and some of the work that they're, uh, that they're doing for us at, uh, at Front Range Biosciences. A quick background on the company, uh, just to give you a little bit of context for why I'm up here and, and talking to you about this, this topic today, is uh, we, we, there's two parts to our business. The first is our clean stock nursery program, which is where we use tissue culture uh, to produce clean, healthy, disease-free plants. And we push them out to growers in a production setting to support their, their growing and production efforts. The other part of our business is, uh, is on the varietal development side. We have a, a plant breeding program and we're combining traditional plant breeding with uh, methods like next generation sequencing and new technologies uh, to improve the process and hopefully develop uh, new varieties uh, that help farmers uh, realize better yields, uh, improvements in their, in their crops that they grow. There's two crops that we currently work with, uh, really three. We work with uh, cannabis, including both industrial hemp as well as the high THC version or, or marijuana. And uh, we also work in coffee. Um, today I'm gonna be, be focused on, uh, on cannabis and, and tissue culture propagation. Uh, we have facilities in Colorado for hemp and uh, in Wisconsin for hemp. And then in California is, is where we do our work in marijuana and, uh, and coffee propagation. So why are we all here? And I have to admit, uh, realizing my slide is, is about eight months old and uh, Jeffrey's slide or Dr. Raver's slide earlier, uh, I need to update my numbers here, but um, you know, there's, there's evidently over a thousand unique small molecules in, uh, in this plant. And it's, it's why we think it's the world's next commodity crop. It's also got a lot of potential as a functional food and nutritional value. Uh, things like polyunsaturated fatty acids that are balanced um, pretty much ideally for, for human consumption between omega-6s and omega-3s. It's also a great protein source with the hemp grain. Um, and then lastly, there's fibers for industrial use. So it's, uh, it's a pretty amazing crop. And uh, it's going to take uh, the collective work of, of a lot of us in this room to help scale the industry. One of the big challenges in a new crop, and it, it came to every crop before this one, was that the supply chain is just not consistent yet, and it's gonna take a lot of time and resource and, uh, and effort to get it there. So just like every other crop, we need materials and inputs that are high quality, high volume. We obviously need uh, plants that are, that are clean. We just heard a little bit about some of the challenges with disease. Pesticides are another big issue. And we also need it to be uniform, right, to support manufacturing applications and, uh, and efficient production processes. Unfortunately, due to prohibition, most cannabis growers and most cannabis companies and, and whatever part of the supply chain you're in, you just haven't had access to a lot of these technologies. And so we're all scrambling right now to build them to, to bring together a supply chain to meet the incredible demand that we're seeing around the world now. So let's dig into the cannabis supply chain for a minute. Today I'm gonna to really talk about the nursery and how tissue culture can be used uh, to help support the supply chain from the very beginning, which is at the nursery. You know, when we look at the, the total supply chain you know, the genetics or the varieties that, that go into the nursery and then those plants go into production farmers and then they go to extractors and processors and then manufacturers and all these other different pieces, the nursery is really at the beginning. And so what I'm hopefully gonna do today is, is talk about ways that you can potentially build a strong foundation uh, for the supply chain. 
So when we look at a traditional cannabis nursery, this is typically what you would see. And a lot of this resulted from prohibition and people being forced to grow in warehouses and garages and, and you know, clandestine uh, spaces. And so um, what you see is, is that it's all vegetative propagation. There's mother plants that have been maintained often for decades. Um, and during those decades, you're simply building up a huge pathogen load, whether it's pests, whether it's some of the molds and mildews that we just saw a lot of amazing pictures of, you know, they're, they're, they're going to simply find their way into your plant. The other thing that you see in traditional nurseries is they're typically right in the production space. So you typically see them on the same facility, same location. And if you look to other crops and, and other large agricultural companies um, that produce specialty or high value crops, their nurseries are always separate from their production facilities. And there's a reason for that. It's so that you can minimize your risk of catastrophic loss due to an infection that, that, that might take out your entire crop. The other thing is, is you build up an insect and pathogen load over time, and as you try to scale up your production efforts, you're really limited in how quickly you can do it, because you might try to get to 5, 10, 15,000 plants, and that's somewhat manageable. Try going to 100,000 or a million plants or even several million plants under management and cultivation, and trying to keep these pests and pathogens at bay becomes a real challenge. So I think this really sets the stage for something that's come to many other crops before this one, and that's virus and outbreaks. So uh, many of the same pests that infect uh, other crops infect cannabis. Thrips, aphids, mites, you know, they're all carrying, or they're all considered vectors for lots of different viruses. And as you begin to scale up a crop, your risk of virus outbreak goes up exponentially. It's the same thing in people, right? The more people travel around, the more we get things like flu virus spreading. It's the same for plants. And so we're going to see that risk, you know, continue to grow as more and more folks come into the industry, more and more markets come online, and people are moving plants, seed, product all over the world. Unfortunately, some of these go undetected. They can lie dormant. They can rear their ugly heads when a plant gets stressed. There's, there's lots of different uh, things, and, and honestly, a lot of it's still unknown. The other thing is viruses and outbreaks will lead to regulatory changes, which can sometimes cripple companies in the short term as, as they have to face uh, you know, strict regulations on how they can move their plants around. I've listed a few crops, um, you know, it's, it's, whether it's fruit, berries, uh, cassava, potato, sugarcane, they've all had uh, their, their, their tough times <laughs> with things like virus. And I, I think we'll, we'll certainly see uh, this happen in cannabis at some point too. Here's an example from blueberries. So blueberries really uh, exploded uh, over the last 20 years um, with, uh, with a lot of, of demand in, uh, on the consumer side. And what you saw is you spread uh, blueberry plants around and started growing them in different regions throughout the Northwest and the Midwest is there were viral outbreaks. And some of them were pretty devastating, and it cost farmers a lot of time and money, and then it eventually led to regulatory changes, things like phytosanitary uh, standards to move plants across state lines and, uh, and other regulations to, uh, to try and mitigate this problem. There's over 900 viruses known to infect plants. Uh, so far, there's, uh, to my knowledge, and, and, and once again, this industry is advancing so fast, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, but there's, we think there's about, there's two right now that are known to infect uh, cannabis or, or hemp, specifically a mosaic and a, and a streak virus, but there's a few others that have been thought to be uh, implicated in, uh, in infecting this plant. Um, that I've listed up here. And the reality is though, is, and we test for a lot of these as part of our clean stock program, but the reality is, is there's still a lot of work to do in the pathology area for, for this crop. Nobody really fully understands, you know, which viruses are infecting and how do we test for them effectively. You know, sample preparation uh, and, and molecular diagnostics is always a big challenge. And when you introduce a new sample matrix, i.e. a new crop, um, you know, there's certainly going to be challenges there. And so uh, we haven't seen a lot of positive IDs, but I don't know that that's because of, uh, of them not actually being there. I think it also could be a, a limitation of some of the uh, testing technologies. The other thing is, is viruses are carried by pests. Unfortunately, there's no uh, federal registration for a lot of pesticides. And in this crop in, in particular, because of the way it gets consumed directly and smoked, um, there's a, a, a very large risk for many pesticides uh, to the consumer. And so it's, it's really important. We're already starting to see recalls uh, that growers aren't using these pesticides uh, on their products, and especially if it's getting distilled and concentrated. 
quick shot of a study done by Steep Hill Labs, I think it was actually last year now, where they tested a bunch of cannabis and saw that over 80% of it was uh, contaminated with some type of pesticide that's, that's uh, prohibited. And uh, you know, this is, this is a big red, big red flag. And I think a lot of companies have been addressing this over the last six months, um, but it, it gives you a sense of the, of the scale of the problem. Consumers are also demanding this. They don't want pesticides. They don't want contaminants, any of it, on their products, whether they're consuming them for food or for recreation or medicine. Um, you know, this is a trend that's been going on for a decade, and I don't expect it to change anytime soon. Uh, as people become more aware and the Internet reaches many more people, you know, they're going to demand that you, that you have clean products. How do we solve this? Well, quality systems. So we can look to other industries like pharma, molecular diagnostics, food safety, um, and there's a lot of quality systems that have already been developed to try and support clean manufacturing, clean, clean production of products. I've listed a few here. Good manufacturing practice is one that really comes out of pharma, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's tough. It's hard to actually implement, but a lot of companies are trying to do this in cannabis. It makes me excited to see. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a great way to, uh, to, to ensure quality in your product. Um, HACCP is another one that's used in food safety. Um, you know, everybody knows probably about ISO, which is about standards uh, for uh, like manufacturing environments. And you know, what I encourage people to do in, in their companies is, is you know, work on this internally. You know, put together documentation packages, SOPs, batch records, quality assurance, quality control systems. Make sure your products are traceable. Uh, you know, these are all really key things as we try to scale the supply chain and, and minimize our risk, uh, both, for, both for your company as, as well as for the industry. And then lastly, make sure that you're, uh, you know, spending a lot of time on personnel training, right? You're only as good as your employees. And so if they're not well trained and versed in some of these things, then it's going to be hard to, uh, to, to have a quality supply chain. So the solution. Tissue culture, clean stock nursery program. Um, I'm going to dig into that for a minute here. This is just uh, some examples from our lab. It shows uh, some plants in tissue culture on one side and then in the greenhouse and, and our clean stock nursery on the other side. Um, there's a lot of, of advantages. I'll talk a little bit about that and then some of the work that goes into setting up tissue culture. Um, but if used properly, it can help mitigate your risk. And it can mitigate your risk of catastrophic crop loss. Um, if you combine a clean stock type program with uh, a strong integrated pest management program, you can actually minimize your need for any pesticides. You can make sure that the product you're putting out at the end uh, is, is clean. So, I've laid out some benefits and some considerations for tissue culture. We get a lot of, uh, of interest in, in this topic, and it's, uh, it's been a pretty hot topic in the industry. And, you know, certainly some of the things that I've been, been talking about here, and, and we'll, we'll dig into, catastrophic crop loss risk mitigation. That's really important, right? Um, clean material that's disease-free, pesticide-free. It allows you to store your, your stock plants much more effectively and in a cleaner, safer environment. Um, it also allows you to deploy new genetics very, very quickly as, as you can you know, ship these clean plants uh, to new locations. Um, one of the things that we've started to see, and, and, and I'm not going to present any data on this, hopefully for maybe next year, um, is we're seeing improved vigor in, in some varieties that have been cloned for a long time that, that go through the program. Um, so that's a, that's a win for the grower. Um, it also helps satis satisfy phytosanitary standards. But there's a lot of considerations here. So a lot of people that I talk to, everybody wants to build their own tissue culture lab. And I, I don't want to discourage them from doing that, but you know, you should go into it with eyes wide open. It's, it's not easy. There's a lot of costs associated with it. It's very resource and labor intensive. Um, it takes a lot longer than most people realize. A lot of tissue culture has been used in research settings and uh, it's certainly valuable there, but to use it in a production setting is a, is a very different beast. The other thing is, is whether you're in tissue culture or the greenhouse or outdoors, there's the risk of off types. These are plants. This is biology. They can mutate at any time. And you always have to control for that. So building a quality system that allows you to check for true to type and that your plants that you're, you're putting out, whether they're for you or for a partner or your customer, that they're, uh, they're meeting specifications. The last is there's a lot of work to do around pathogen testing. And I've already talked a little bit about that, but you know, evaluating what pathogens need to be screened for. Last, it's a new crop for tissue culture. So we're just at the very beginning. If you look at some other crops, it's taken years, sometimes even close to a decade, to build strong tissue culture production systems and clean stock standards uh, that, that help a, a, a crop um, in an industry thrive. 
A big problem that we see in tissue culture is cannabis diversity. So uh, if, if some of you got to see uh, Dr. Jonathan Page's talk yesterday, I, I'm signing a paper of, of theirs here, but you know, there's a, a huge amount of diversity in cannabis. And unfortunately, we're starting to understand it, thanks to a lot of work um, that you know, folks in, in this room and, and around the world are doing, and, and we're working on some of that as well. It's gonna take a collective effort, but the reality is, is right now it's still very early. And so what we see is that in tissue culture, some of them don't respond as well, and, uh, and there's really a lot of work to do to, to better characterize uh, our, our genotypes. Three minutes. Real quick, bacterial contamination. So the first part of tissue culture process is to clean out all of the things that you just saw in the previous presentation which infect your plant. They can be on the surface, they can be inside. Here's just a few examples from our lab of, of some of the things we've seen. Um, you know, these bacteria can come out, like I said, either from the surface or internal to the plant tissue. Fungal contamination is another big one. We see a lot of fungus. And so part of the first part of, uh, of tissue culture is to clean these out. So we take them through multi multiple iterations of multiplication and cleanup through the initiation process to eventually get rid of this. And you know, then you can start up your production arm and, and start releasing clean plants. But it, it can take you know, six to nine months to get through this process to get rid of all of these pathogens. Once you get through it though, you take it into a rooting stage, you develop healthy roots, and then you get it ready for production. So here's a couple examples from our lab of some clean, healthy plants that have made it through the process. They've got a strong, healthy root system and they're ready to go into the next stage, which would be acclimatization. Here's another example of some uh, really you know, good, healthy specimens from our lab. Uh, they give you a sense of, of what cannabis tissue culture should look like, and you can see nice, green, healthy, vigorous plants. Uh, these are gonna go out and, and produce very, uh, you know, very quality plants for production. Last, we'll just finish up with some pictures from the field. These are uh, some of our, from some of our hemp customers in one of our uh, field trials that we ran this year uh, with some of our, our plants that came out of the hemp tissue culture lab um, and our greenhouse nursery in, in Lafayette. And uh, you know, this is what we're all trying to achieve. And, and this is obviously outdoor and, and hemp production, but um, I could show you a similar picture from the greenhouse. And this is the goal for, uh, for all of us. One minute. So I'll finish up here. Um, my email address is here. If you'd like to uh, reach out to me directly, feel free. Uh, I'm gonna stick around afterwards and I think we've got a really great panel coming up uh, with a few other folks on the cultivation side uh, that I'm gonna get to join here in, in about 20 minutes. So thank you very much. We might have a quick 30 seconds if somebody yeah, wants to ask a question. Yeah, we have about 30 seconds, yeah. I, I was wondering, with the tissue, uh, with the tissue samples, or the producing that way, can you produce from the nice seed as well? And are you doing that for? I'm talking hemp. Yes. Here. So yeah, we we have a, a seed breeding program as well, and we'll be releasing some seed this year. Um, but yeah, you can certainly produce really quality plants out of seed. There's some advantages and disadvantages, which I'll, I'll try to get to in the panel because um, we're going to run out of time here. But um, and I'd be happy to talk with you. But there's there's reasons for both, um, for sure.